to answering some questions because I get people asking me the craziest questions. I think we might be live now. Um, okay. So I'm going to operate under the assumption that we're live. There we go. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this collaborative program between the Culinary Literacy Center at the Free Library of Philadelphia and the Greater Philadelphia Coalition Against Hunger. And the program is called SNAP 101, Everything You Need to Know to Get Started. My name is Aurora Sanchez. I work for the Culinary Literacy Center on a project called Healthy Communities. And I am joined by three wonderful guests who will now introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Claire Richardson. I am a SNAP Hotline Counselor. Hi, I'm Kathy Fisher and I'm the Policy Director at the Coalition Against Hunger. And I am Katie Milholland and I am the Community Educator at the Coalition Against Hunger. Thank you all so much. So we're gonna begin with Claire giving us some basic overviews about SNAP um, and why folks should be interested in what they should know. Okay, now when it comes to SNAP, I know a lot of people were used to calling SNAP um, food stamps. Um, they come up with, they've come up with a different name at the USDA, um, SNAP, which means Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. So basically what this program is, is anyone who needs additional resources to help them stretch their budget to buy food. And it usually, um, right now, <laughs> it's anybody who, you know, would be, you know, have their income change due to COVID, lose their income entirely, have an addition to the family, or people who've like left school and they've come home and, you know, the budget isn't exactly, you know, I guess, um, easy for people to be able, like, say it was just mom and dad and one or two you know, siblings at home, but now you got three other college kids in the house. And so, and there's still only one income or two incomes and that might not stretch for food, things like that. That's what SNAP is for. Now it's very um, easy, the process. I know when you think about it outside of getting assistance and you think I don't, wouldn't even know where to begin with that, that seems like a long process. And it also seems hard to do because all of the offices are closed. You may have heard they're closed. You may have heard there are people inside. You see cars in the parking lot, but why can't you get in? But the guard opens the door and gives you an application and the application is 12 pages long. So you're kind of a little lost trying to figure out how you can apply for SNAP. So you would give us a call at the Coalition Against Hunger SNAP hotline. We'd walk you through the process over the phone. We streamline it based on your particular situation and um, we help you submit the application and then it bounces electronically to the county office. They process it and you will get a card in the mail if you've never had food stamps or if you had them a while ago and you started working and then you lost your job and now your unemployment has stopped and there's really no income and you're trying to figure out how to make ends meet or, or you're just waiting, you're keep, you keep filing but nothing's happening feel free to give us a call at the SNAP hotline, 215-430-0556. We'll be more than happy to help you. So Kathy, Kathy, uh, we're gonna open it up for you to tell us a little bit about the COVID-19 changes related to SNAP. Okay, great. Thanks, Claire, for going over the, the signing up for SNAP part. So there have been some, some really good things um, that Congress has done to try to make SNAP more responsive given the horrible situation we all find ourselves in with COVID. Um, so the, I'll go from most recent to the most distant now that we've been in this situation almost a full year. So most recently um, in January, uh, SNAP received a 15% increase in the benefits themselves, right? So. A, a single person on SNAP used to get about $196 a month, I think, and now it's up to $234, right? So benefit levels are given based on the household size. So if you have one person receiving SNAP, you're going to get a different amount than if you have five people in your household. But every single benefit level was increased by 15%. 
And that increase it, in the legislation, it's um, from January until June of this year. So, so far, Congress has only decided to increase that benefit level for the first six months of this year. We, of course, are going to fight hard to have them continue that increase, and we'll need as much help as we can get. So anyone out there who wants to advocate can sign up on our, our website. But that is the first important change that people need to know about with SNAP is that it is actually a slightly higher benefit right now. Um, another thing that happened uh, in January as a benefit of the legislation that passed that in late in December last year is that there's more access to SNAP for college students. So it used to be if you were a college student, if you had work study, you were eligible for SNAP, but you had to be in a work study position or if you were working 20 hours a week. But as we all know with COVID, lots of jobs are no longer available from the part-time jobs lots of students used to hold to also work study positions. Um, even students who have been eligible, deemed eligible for work study can't always get a position right now. So Congress did two important things and that's that any college student um, who meets all the other SNAP requirements, unfortunately, you know, you can't get rid of the other requirements, the income requirements, and that depends on who you live with. Um, so all the other rules remain the same, and you can call our hotline and Claire and Alejandra will help you apply following all those rules. I don't have, I'm not going to go through all the rules, but for college students, the important part is if you um, are eligible for work study, even if you are not currently in a work study position, you can you will be eligible for SNAP. Or if your expected family contribution is what it's called, your EFC for the current academic year is zero. So basically, if your family in your when you fill out your FAFSA and get financial aid for college, if your family is supposed to contribute zero dollars, cannot afford to contribute you can be eligible for SNAP now. Those are two new things um, about SNAP that have really made it more accessible for college students. Um, and we know that you know college student hunger is, is a big problem. There are lots of students because tuition is so high just struggling to make ends meet. So we encourage college students to apply and to also let their friends know, let people know that these new eligibility um, flexibilities are in. And these we expect will continue until um, the end of the public health emergency, right? So pretty much everyone anticipates this rule will remain in effect for all of 2021. And we'll have to see how much longer it might go. Um, so that's another important rule. And then the last thing that's happening with SNAP right now that's really important for some of the people who get SNAP is a thing that's called emergency allotments. So back in March of last year, when all the COVID shutdowns began, Congress recognized that there were supply chain issues. Sometimes you'd go to the store and you couldn't get what you needed, things like that. They recognized that families um, who were relying on SNAP benefits needed some extra money to buy the food that they needed to feed their families. So what they did is they allowed for extra SNAP dollars. But the problem is USDA interpreted it, that to be just for families who were not receiving the maximum benefit. So unfortunately, if, if you're in a household that is already getting the maximum amount of SNAP for your household size, so again, I'll go back to that one person example. If you're already getting that $234 a month, you don't get any extra SNAP. But if you're somebody who's working a little, has some income or maybe gets social security, a, a senior, and was only getting a partial SNAP benefit, you get bumped up to the maximum amount. So right now, for every household that's receiving SNAP, they'll get their, their normal SNAP dollars at the beginning of the month. And then those who are not getting the maximum benefit get a second SNAP payment in the second half of the month that bumps them up to the maximum amount, amount for their household size. So that is a real help to families. For instance, maybe you know a parent who's working part-time, struggling to get by, gets partial SNAP, at the beginning of the month, but then gets this extra payment later in the month, particularly with kids home from school, you know, that is a big benefit to be getting those extra dollars. So I guess the moral of the story to me with, with these changes is if you think you might be eligible, you should apply, especially if you are working, you have some income, but you know, your hours have been cut, your, your wages are much lower than they were before the pandemic. It's worth applying because even if you get just a, a small SNAP grant, 
with that emergency allotment right now, you'll be bumped up to the full amount. And again, that's also something that we expect to last so long as the public health emergency at the state and federal level at the state and federal level lasts. So it's a little hard to predict exactly how long that will go on, but we know it's not gonna, you know, neither of those things are going away overnight. For so I would say for at least another six months or so, those will remain in place and the federal emergency will probably stay in place all year. Um, so those are important resources. And the one last thing I wanna mention that changed is if you're getting pandemic unemployment compensation, which back in the spring and summer was an extra 600 a week. Currently it's an extra $300 a week that changed unfortunately, but in the spring and summer that $600 counted as income. So a lot of people who would apply for SNAP weren't eligible because that extra unemployment money actually put them over the income limit for SNAP. And that was unfortunate. And they fixed that this most recent time when they passed the extra unemployment benefits, they specifically said the, this extra 300 a week does not count as income for purposes of Medicaid or SNAP. Um, so right now, if you're reporting your income um, when you apply for SNAP, you would not include that extra 300 a month in, in unemployment that families are getting right now. So again, that's a way, um, hopefully, that more people will qualify for SNAP now than did um, in the spring and summer. Thank you, Kathy. Katie is going to tell us about other food resources and food pantry maps. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so while today's session is called SNAP 101, um, we understand that for most people, often SNAP is not enough to get you through the month. So while it's really important to be talking about SNAP and learning about SNAP, um, it's also important to talk about other food res resources that people can turn to. So I wanna highlight just a few food pantry maps that you can go to if you are looking for additional food resources. So the first food pantry map that we are recommending that people visit is the City of Philadelphia food pantry map. And the website, um, I believe it's gonna be going into the Facebook chat so you can see it there, but I'll just say it, it's www.phila.gov slash food. And this is a food pantry map uh, for the city of Philadelphia. You can search by address and it's gonna have three different type of food sites on it. So number one are just general food sites. And these are places that any resident is eligible. You pick up a box of food. There is no ID or proof of income required. The next type of site is a student meal site. So students who are missing out on those school lunches, um, families can go pick up grab and go meals for their students. And those sites include both district schools and charter schools. So there are sites all over the city. I would definitely recommend any families with kids trying to see if there's something close by so that they can go get these grab and go meals. And then the third type of site is the senior meal sites. So these are gonna be sites that are open to adults 60 and over. Um, and they are supported by the Philadelphia Corporation for Aging PCA. Only thing you have to know about these sites is that seniors must call ahead to reserve meals prior to pickup. Once they do that, it's gonna be grab and go meals. So those are three types of sites, um, great resources that families can turn to just to get a little bit of extra food assistance. Now, the other source that I wanna point you all to is called Community Resource Connects. And that website is just www.communityresourceconnects Dot org. And this is going to be another place where you can go to access food pantries. You can search by zip code so you can find something that's close by and convenient to you. And you're going to find lots of information such as, you know, the food pantry location, hours that they're open, a phone number to call. We always recommend calling ahead to make sure that that food pantry is open before you visit because you never know what's going on. And while the city of Philadelphia food pantry map that I was just talking about, it's gonna have more city supported sites. Community Resource Connect is gonna be your place to go for those privately run food pantries. But the best part about Community Resource Connects is that it's actually not just a resource for food pantries. You can find lots of other different resources on Community Resource Connect. So, if you visit that website, you can find information on housing and utilities, on transit, on medical care, 
on legal and financial resources. So it's a really, really good one-stop shop because we understand that right now, people are not only needing food resources, but they're needing more general resources. So I would highly recommend visiting that website, looking around and seeing if you can connect to additional food and or other resources that might be helpful for people during this time. Awesome. We're going to have Kathy come back and give us one last update. Um, and then we'll tell you a little bit more about what the free library has to offer. Thank you. Yeah, there is one thing I forgot to mention. And that's right now we're, we're seeing a lot of people actually get cut off of their SNAP. And that is in part due to um, mail issues, people not getting their paperwork in the mail, um, it coming late, them getting it after the date it's due. But it's also because for a while at the beginning of the pandemic, they actually stopped requiring renewal paperwork. Um, the, the Department of Human Services was like, okay, because of COVID, the feds are allowing us this flexibility. We're not gonna do this paperwork, but that started up again in the fall. And we've seen a lot of people get tripped up by this. So this is really just a reminder. There's unfortunately right now, there's no magic solution to this. We are trying to get um, there to be more flexibility around the paperwork, but right now, it's just a reminder to really look out for your SNAP paperwork in the mail if you're receiving SNAP. If you apply now, I would write down when you started and make a note on your, you know, if it's on your calendar in your phone or somehow put a note up on your refrigerator with a magnet, however you want to do it. Note when you, you usually have to do renewal paperwork six months after you start your SNAP and again every year. So it's pretty much every six months. The, the six month renewal can also be done online. If you have a My Compass account, that's the online way to, to access your SNAP account. And there's also a My Compass mobile app, um, which is, I've been told, fairly easy to use. Um, it's just not well known enough. Um, and our, our hotline counselors do coach people over the phone with it. So it's it's something that you can pick up if you try. And it's, it is important to try to stay on top of your paperwork because it's horrible to go to the store and find out your benefits didn't load that month because of some paperwork that you didn't maybe didn't even get. Um, the other thing you can do is call the customer service hotline for DHS and ask, like, when is my renewal due? So all of these things I'm mentioning, including what I covered before, we have good flyers posted um, on our website and those can be shared. So I can't put them up now, but you know, all those phone numbers and that information is on, are on different flyers um, that we can make sure are, are shared after this. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I want to tell y'all a little bit about what we have going on at the Free Library. Um, again, my name is Aurora Sanchez. I work for the Culinary Literacy Center. I specifically work on a project called Healthy Communities, which is a department, um, which is a collaboration with the Department of Public Health. Um, but so when it comes to the Free Library, um, there are computers available at select locations. Um, there are all kinds of free virtual programs. All of the CLC's programs are free to SNAP participants. Um, and Healthy Communities in particular has upcoming programs like A Taste of African Heritage, which actually starts on Thursday. It's a partnership with Coleman Library. Um, we know that we're gonna be doing A Taste of Latin American Heritage on Saturdays starting in May. Um, and the best way to keep track of us and the best way to find out what we have to offer is our website, freelibrary.org. You can find all of the free libraries on social media. In particular, you can keep up with the Culinary Literacy Center at Free Library Cook on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, and so before we get into the q and I just want to circle back to, to my fellow panelists, my fellow speakers, to see if there's anything else you all want to add um, before we start getting into questions. All good? <laughs> All I guess good. the only thing that I would say is just, um, you know, between our SNAP hotline and doing outreach events like this, and hopefully there are lots of uh, different resources that we've created being posted in the chat. Um, I hope that people can come away from this event feeling less alone. Um, SNAP can feel really daunting if you are trying to start that process on your own. Um, and I hope that if nothing else, people take away that like, there are organizations out there who are there to provide support and help you out. Um, so I hope that this makes people feel less alone and a little bit more supported as they try to go through this really, you know, confusing and complicated and frustrating process sometimes. I agree, I agree. 
Now there's a question here. If I want to apply for SNAP using Compass, what is the website I should use? So what you should use, it's called, um, it's www.compass, C-O-M-P-A-S-S, dot state, dot P-A, dot U-S. Now that is the Compass website that you could go on. A lot of times it can be very glitchy. Um, I remember when I was applying for Compass, um, before I even began working as a SNAP hotline counselor, it kept cutting off on me. Like it kept sending me around to different things. I needed a state ID key. I needed this. I didn't have any idea what any of that stuff was. So before you get frustrated, lock yourself out and mess up the process for you, just give us a call. You know, you'll, you'll be put on a list and sometimes it's a bit of a wait, but once we get to you and your application is submitted, the process speeds up, you know, especially if you're eligible for emergency. Once your application is submitted, you can um, just give it, in most cases, I'd say 48 to 72 hours, you know, before you would even hear whether you were approved, denied, or in process of you know, getting your benefits. Sometimes it can happen, the emergency allotment can happen anywhere from you know, two to five days. And then the in-process portion is someone who is not quite eligible for emergency, but you're still eligible for food stamps, you'd have to wait about 30 days. But you, you can use the website, but if you're having problems with the website, just feel free to give us a call. And then the other thing I'll add is, um, I think there's no better way to apply for SNAP than calling the hotline. I think we have the best hotline counselors around. Um, but I will say, if you're someone who really wants to give it a go applying online, we do have a compass guide. So you can find that on our website. Uh, it's in a little section called how to apply for SNAP, I believe on your own is what it's called. Um, and that is kind of a step-by-step -step guide. We try to walk you through the process. Um, we have some troubleshooting, some frequently asked questions that can't solve like technology glitches if that's what you're coming up against when you're trying to apply online. But if you're someone who really wants to give it a go to apply you know, on yourself using Compass, we do have that guide for that little bit of extra support. But again, I think there's no better way to apply for SNAP than to call our hotline. I see there's a question in the chat too about how long will it take um, to get my benefits to use the grocery store? Um, I mean, there's a little bit, it, it kind of, it depends, unfortunately, is the answer. But um, as Claire explained, it takes, if you get emergency, you can be approved in a pretty short amount of time. Um, the, the normal processing time for applications used to be around seven days. Now it's around nine or 10. Like they're, they're, things have slowed down a little. But the big question is if you were on SNAP before and you still have your EBT card, you should let them know that when you apply because you can get benefits back on that card. And that will shorten the wait time you have because they can load the, you know, if you're re signed up, they can load the benefits on that existing card and you can go to the store as soon as those are loaded. Um, but right now we're finding that those who are new to the SNAP program and have to have a card mailed to them because county assistance offices are closed and you can no longer go over to the office and pick up your new card, it is taking a while, again, because of the mail delays. The company that creates the cards is in Texas. So there's already a little bit of a you know, mail time that has to be built in. But then because of U US Postal Service delays, um, it is taking a while. We've seen it take you know, some clients almost a month to get the card mailed to them. I don't, I think things since Christmas, the mail is speeding up some, but it's still not super fast. So I'm sorry, we can't give like a real, you know, rule about how long it takes. Um, but if you do have that EBT card from a previous time you're on SNAP, we'd highly recommend you make sure to put that in the notes or, or let Claire or Alejandra, when you talk to our hotline staff, let them know that um, so that the DHS can load the benefits on your existing card. Okay, I can answer this question. Uh, my friend needs help applying for SNAP benefits but does not speak English. Can the Coalition Against Hunger SNAP hotline help her? Yes, in most cases. Um, 
we do have uh, Spanish speaking um, hotline counselors that can assist a client who speaks Spanish. Normally outside of that, we would have to call um, an outside service we have called Language Line. And here lately, it was a little glitchy, but I've managed to figure it out a little bit. So we can now call, if someone calls me, I had a woman called me, um, she needed um, Creole. And um, I had to call the language line so she could have a Creole speaker help her um, to apply for food stamps for her children. Um, she wasn't eligible because she, she wasn't a citizen and she you know, needed additional um, information in order to become a citizen. So the bottom line was her children were born here and they were citizens and they were eligible. So I was able to help her apply for her children. And um, you know, she got her benefits pretty quickly. So you know, I was happy to hear that her card didn't take forever in a day. I was very happy to hear that because she really needed them. So we are able to assist a client um, who needs, um, I guess who, who isn't, you know, who doesn't speak English and who has, you know, some kind of impediment in, 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 in reference to reaching us or having that done. I've had a lot of people not be able to get their food stamps because there is no one to help them. And um, when they finally call us, that, that's what prompted me to try to figure it out, to jerry-rig the phones and try to figure it out so we could all, um, you know, be able to do this from home to assist people because there are a lot of people without assistance or without friends that speak English as well. So they can speak for them over the phone. So we're here to help. We can help you with that. So we have a question. I have a green card. Can I apply for SNAP benefits? So it gets very tricky with different immigration status um, issues and we are not, you know, immigration attorneys. But what we can tell you is that um, for the most part, if you are a legal immigrant, you need to have been in the United States for five years in order to qualify for SNAP. So just having a green card won't make you eligible, but having a green card and being here for at least five years will make you eligible. As Claire mentioned in answer to the last question, citizen children, even if their parents are undocumented, are eligible, right? If a child is born here, a parent can apply for the children um, without having to put the parents' information on, on the application. And that is something that we know, even though those kids are eligible, a lot of families were hesitant to apply, particularly under the previous federal administration, because there were a lot of threats against immigrant families and, and real fear in the community. So we strongly encourage those families to apply if they need help. If the child is a citizen, if they're here legally and they've they've been here the five years. Now, if you're a refugee or an asylee, which means you've been granted permission to come in because of a situation in your home country, you're, you are um, eligible immediately. That, that does not have a five-year waiting period. So there's a lot of other immigration, uh, immigration status um, that I don't, I can't go into the different ones, the HB1 visas and all that um, kind of detail, but um, those are kind of the general parameters. So our next question, I would like to tell my local elected officials about issues I'm having with SNAP. How can I do that? Well, we certainly encourage people to call their legislators all the time. Um, often we're calling them to tell them to vote a certain way or you know, that we want them to support um, certain mm -hmm. programs or legislation. But in this case, if it is specifically about your SNAP case, you can absolutely call your elected officials. Um, you know, I would suggest call your state rep or your, your state um, senator, if it's an issue with the administration of staff, if it's something with the Department of Human Services and how your, your benefits are being administered, it's more of a state issue. If it's something about SNAP itself, the program, the federal, it's federally run, all the rules are federal, um, I would call your elected official at the federal level. So that's either in Philly, that's Representative Evans or Representative Boyle or um, Representative Scanlon. She has a, a smaller part of South Philly. 
Um, and then, of course, Senators Casey and Senator Toomey are for all of Pennsylvania. So if it's a federal issue, call them. Um, it's not that you couldn't call a city council person, but they don't really have any kind of control over SNAP. They might be interested to know about some of the issues, um, but it's really the, you know, state and federal um, the way the program is run. Awesome. So that was our last question. Um, so first, I want to thank you all for um, partnering with us to bring this information out to the public. It is really important that people have access to, to food. Um, talk about something just really fundamental to, to living. Um, and it's really important that they get answers around as as Katie, you described it, what can be sort of a complicated and frustrating process. So I wanna say thank you to you all for your for your really thoughtful answers. Um, thank you for, for being here with us. And I just wanted to see if there was anything else that you all wanted to share before we wrap up. I will say one more thing, only because we have time. We were supposed to go a little longer, so might as well. Um, there is another benefit that many families have been asking about. Um, it's called PEBT, mm -hmm. um, so pandemic. EBT, which was a new thing, completely new, that was created in the spring in response to COVID. And this is a benefit for families whose kids are missing out on school meals. So for instance, in Philadelphia, um, because the Philadelphia school district serves meals free to all kids, every child in the Philadelphia school district schools and in many charter schools um, received PEBT in the spring and families have kind of wondered what happened to it, is it coming? Am I gonna get that extra money because schools have still been closed? And there's a, a good news, bad news here. The good news is Congress did reauthorize the program. So PEBT is coming again. The bad news is that all fall um, USDA in, in DC was very slow about telling states how they were gonna structure it for this school year. And that's in part, because if you remember in the spring, all schools closed completely. So it made it easier to identify, okay, all kids who are missing school meals missed every single day and we can issue this benefit. But because this school year all over the country, there have been very different approaches to school closures. Some schools have been open most of the time. Some like in Philly have been closed. Many have been hybrid. So it makes it a lot harder for the Department of Education in Harrisburg to be able to say what's going on with every single student who would have been getting school meals, right? Some kids are getting them two days a week because they're in school two days. And okay, I won't go on and on, it's confusing. So it took a while and I know as of today, Pennsylvania has submitted its plan to USDA. So each state has to submit its plan of how it's gonna deal with this. Not sure exactly how long it will take USDA to respond and approve or, or change the plan or negotiate with the state. But we anticipate that families won't be getting benefits probably till later in April, like late in April, um, because it is a complicated program. So it's really unfortunate that families have been needing this, these extra dollars all the way since September. But when the benefit is issued, um, again, we're estimating April, don't hold me to that, I'm not exactly sure, but they'll get one lump sum to cover all the missed school days from September through January. And then there'll be a second PEBT payment later in the summer. So, so people don't get too huge a sum. Um, but we are really happy that that plan has gone in. Um, and the other good news is that PEBT has been extended to serve younger children as well. Um, unfortunately, that part of the plan is still coming because it's, it's complicated as well. But um, kids under age six will also be eligible for PEBT and that will go out a little bit later in the spring. So I can jump in um, and just, you know, my sort of final remark is I would really um, encourage people to get connected to the Coalition Against Hunger uh, via our email list. So we send out actually weekly emails um, and we talk about, you know, our SNAP hotline, our work with the pantries, and we talk about, you know, all of the important advocacy updates that people need to have. So as an example, you know, as soon as we get more information about when families should see those PEBT benefits, that email is where we're gonna share that information. So if you want sort of the most up-to-date information on anti-hunger programs, because right now with COVID things 
are changing from month to month. And if you want the most up-to-date information, you want to understand what's going on with these programs, the best thing I can tell you is get connected to our email list, get those emails. And then also Kathy, our policy director, does a lot of advocacy work. And we like to communicate with people through advocacy alerts, which are emails that we send to try to get people involved in advocacy pushes. So I would definitely say get connected to both of those email lists. They're great sources of information. Um, I think that the link to the email list is uh, in the chat right now, so you should all be able to see it. But if not, um, our website is hungercoalition.org, and you can get connected to all of our emails there. Thank you all again for joining us. Um, you can find all of the free libraries of Philadelphia online at freelibrary.org. And again, you can stay connected with us right here, um, Free Library Cook on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. Thank you all so much. Be well, be safe. Thank you.